Which member left a demanding corporate career and moved to another continent to spend more time with family? Find out by going to www.bookinterrupted.com forward slash members and get to know us a little more. Parental guidance is recommended because this episode has mature topics and strong language. Here are some moments you can look forward to during this episode of Book Interrupted. We would like to welcome Squiggy, our fan, to the show and his fan book choice, White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. And that's when Book Interrupted reached out to me, calling my bluff. So that's <laughs> one of the reasons why I'm here, because I'm like, well, I said I'd talk about this book. And uh, I can't wait till the, for the white woman tears for one, because we there are a lot of tears on this show already. Like I'm learning and I'm like, man, I can't get out of my own way on this. My literally my own skin on this. You know, all of our history, all of the words that people use. It's it's this like whitewashed idea. Um, he was like he didn't even know to think otherwise. The question. I want to call it like a a mine, like a landmine that uh, white people can step on. Mind, body, and soul. The is the goal. Try to learn something new. Disrupted. Mind, body, and soul. Uh, Inspiration is the uh, And we're gonna talk it uh, out. On Book Interrupted. Welcome to Book Interrupted, a book club for busy people to connect and one that celebrates life's interruptions. Hi, I'm Sarah. I started Book Interrupted and asked the closest people to me to be part of it. First, I asked my sister. Hi, I'm Meredith, the sister. My first friend. Hi, I'm Kim, the first friend. My old roommate. Hi, I'm Lindsay, the old roommate. My high school friend. Hi, I'm Kara, the high school friend. My good friend and Kara's sister. That's me. Hi, I'm Leah, Sarah's friend, Kara's sister, and the final member of Book Interrupted. If you'd like to join along... This book cycle is from May 9th to June 13th. It's the fan book choice, and Squiggy will be joining us for this book cycle. The book that we're reading is White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. In this in-depth exploration, this book examines how white fragility develops, how it protects racial inequality, and what we can do to engage more constructively. White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism by Robin D'Angelo was released in June of 2018. It debuted on the New York Times bestseller list, where it remained for 85 weeks and is currently being translated into five languages. It is also currently a number one bestseller on Amazon.ca, among many other booksellers, and gained even more sales after the protests surrounding the death of George Floyd in May of 2020. Sales of anti-racism books in general rose by up to 6,800% around that time, according to Forbes and NDP BookScan. Robin D'Angelo coined the term white fragility. She has a PhD in multicultural education, has been a consultant, educator, and facilitator for over 20 years on issues of racial and social justice, and has worked with a wide range of organizations, including private, nonprofit, and governmental. All right, so it's personal journal time. Let's see what the members of Book Interrupted thought outside the group. Personal journal. Why I chose this book. During the height of the George Floyd protests and the BLM marches, I wanted to educate myself. So I came across a list of books I should be reading. And honestly, this was the shortest one of the bunch. So that's why I chose that. After reading it, I put it out on social media that if anyone wanted to talk to me about it, I'd be willing to engage with them in dialogue. And Sarah and Lindsay called my bluff and asked if I'd be on the podcast. And I said if I was going to talk about it with anybody, I would talk to them about it. So that is why I'm going on this podcast. And it's a rather intimidating notion, but my goal with it won't be to educate, it won't be to judge, it won't be to even give that much of an approval. I found, especially over the last year of it, as I dealt with more and more anti-racism dialogue and conversations, the best thing I can do is listen. So that is what I'm going to do on this 
first episode of the podcast is going with the intention of listening and seeing what happens. Yeah, thanks. My feelings around racism are reaching a tipping point where I now feel more uncomfortable about my silence and inaction than I am about talking about racism. And I find myself wholly unequipped to take the next step. And so I'm very excited about this book because I want to do better. I want to do better for our global community. I want to do better for my children. And I want to do better for the future. Hi. So this is my personal journal, my first personal journal for White Fragility by Robin. I don't know if I'm going to say it's it. D'Angelo. So I'm nervous about this book. Uh, it's going to be hard to judge this book because, well, because I'm white. <laughs> There's no other way to put it. Like some of the books we that we've read so far in the in Book Interrupted have been choices for, well, that were made for me. And then they were, I could be critical of them because it wasn't my thing. Or like, I don't like the tone or the, you know, like I, I, I could judge it based on pettier things than I can judge this one on. This one is going to be an education. And the contents, I assume I'll agree with most of it. Um, I may not agree with all of it, but it'll be hard to dismiss it as liking or not liking it. Well, because of the content, I, I can't imagine it's going to be a giggle fest of like light fluff. It's going to be an education and it's going to be uncomfortable and it's going to be hard to speak about the book as a good or bad read because I just I just know it's going to be really informative and I've never read a book like this ever at all. I had heard about this book and I actually listened to a podcast with an interview with her on um Armchair Expert, which is a great podcast and so that's where I first heard about this book. I find it uh I find it all really fascinating and I think it's a book that will be one of an important book to have read. So, uh that's it. That's all I got right now. I'm nervous. Then, oh, well, that's the worst thing that happens to you. You're all set. Anyways, catch you on the next PJ. Bye-bye. Okay, white fragility. I haven't got my book yet. I'm probably going to have to listen to the audiobook because I can't get it here. I've tried. <laughs> and uh, I can't even get it shipped here. So, I mean, there is part of me that's a bit concerned. Like, I don't want to alienate my loved ones, uh, my friends and family. But at the same time, if this is what's going to change the world, books like this and discussions like this, then, then we, like, that's why I want to do it. Because um, honestly, I don't think my heart could take the thought that like things would stay at the status quo. So we're going to do white fragility, and I'm looking forward to it. I think if nothing else, it'll educate us six women and hopefully um, more people than that. Hopefully it's like a pebble in a pond and there's a ripple effect. Okay. So white fragility, this will be uncomfortable. That's okay though. It's supposed to be. I did um, some work at my work in this area with a different book where we were journaling and really self-reflecting. I haven't got my white fragility book yet but I am expecting that it is similar. I wonder if the book White Fragility covers other kind of white privilege issues. I don't even know what you would call them, but there's other names for the ways in which racism hides in the white experience that were they not to be pointed out and named, I think the naming of the, I don't know what to call them, symptoms, that's what I'll call them for now because I don't have a better word. I think the naming of the symptoms is very important to the conversation. So before where a person of color might not have been able to say like, you're doing this thing because it didn't have a name. Now, not only could a person of color call someone out and say, that's what this is. And that is a form of racism. And better yet, white people can understand 
the definition of some of these symptoms and then apply them to themselves and find out where they could improve. And some of it, from what the other book I read, is really eye-opening. It's really scary because the nature of racism, like systemic, like societal racism in a community that's been based off of colonialism and dominance and hierarchies. And I mean, I don't even know if I have enough words, but the reality of racism for a white person who comes from Um, the lineage of the people who set up the system in these disadvantaged ways, the nature of it is it's invisible. So it's really, really scary as a white person to have the veil pulled back because then you realize that you've been participating. And when you realize you've been participating, of course, you feel bad because many people like to think that I'm not racist or, you know, I'm for equal, whatever you want to call yourself, right? But many people, when you get the veil pulled back and you realize that you didn't even realize that you were participating in a in racism, then uh, it's it's pretty upsetting. Um, I always default back to not as upsetting as the experience of people of color or indigenous people or any other group that is a minority or experiences oppression at the hand of basically white supremacy. It's funny too, because we're conditioned to think that these words are certain things. It's all about the words again. Like the, it's funny how the language is so powerful in the journey, because if we're to call the system white supremacy, then you start freaking out. You're like, I'm not in the KKK. I don't believe this. I don't think that. And you have all these ideas attached to the words white supremacy. Like even when I said white supremacy before, because I'm, I'm working to call it what it is rather than try to beat around the bush or use words that are softer or less scary. But I notice in myself when I use the words, when I call it what it is, it does compel an emotional response from me. And I think that's part of the problem and an area from which to pursue the solution. It's it's all about this self-recognition and understanding, really understanding what the system is and how the system works and how the system has served you and how, by virtue of your social position within the system, you have been advantaged, privileged, or disadvantaged, depending on who you are and where you fall. I wonder if I should end now. I have lots to say, but I fear that I'm going to like sum it all up in this intro and then not have more to say as I go on. Well, maybe I'll just have faith that I'll have other things to say because I don't even have the book yet. I already forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, one of the problems that I think comes up when this topic is on the table are people who are white, but who don't feel privileged. Um, People who are white, but have experienced adversity, unfairness, disadvantage in their life, right? I feel that there's a level of defensiveness that can come up with them because they're like, I'm not privileged. I don't have privilege, right? And I think it's important. One of the first important kind of lessons or teachings in this work is to grasp the concept that you can have white privilege and also be poor. You can have white privilege and also be disadvantaged. I hesitate to sum something up because I think it's too complex for nutshells, but great risk. I'll proceed and say the difference between white privilege and not having white privilege is that you've never received a disadvantage because of your skin color. And you may have been given an inherent advantage that you maybe don't even recognize. That's that what I was talking about earlier, the invisibility of it, because of your skin color. That's the difference. So you can have a shitty life and be poor and have a broken family and all these things and be white and still have white privilege. You may not be part of the 1%, the people who have made all the rules. Like you're suffering too. That's the other point too, is that for white people to understand, um, it's not like us against them. I look at like more like us against the system and the system is not helping the majority of white people either. We are all advantaged by it by virtue of our skin color being the same skin color of the dominant kind of force, like the power on the side of the power, I guess. But the system in and of itself is not, it doesn't work as someone who is of lower socioeconomic status, regardless of skin color, can tell you. It's just worse for people of color. 
but the system itself is not something that works, but it doesn't work for the many. It works for the few. And that's been the problem all along. So I guess that's where I'll end it. I think that's all I have to say right now. But it's scary because we will have to see where we have participated in racism. And it's hard to see that because you don't want many people. I know I'll speak for myself. I know I don't want to be considered racist or I don't want to have done something that is racist. But I already know that I I can think of when I learned about microaggressions, I can think of times when I delivered microaggressions, not on purpose, right? And and intention doesn't matter, though. That's the point. That's the problem is that there is no, there's no way out, so to speak. You can't say, I didn't mean it. It doesn't matter. It's for you to do better, right? I can think of times when I've used white silence because it was more comfortable for me. And that is reflective of privilege because I have the option of doing that. Anyway, so it's not nice to to realize these things and then be able to identify when you did them. But it's important that you detach yourself from the fact that you're now a bad person because you've realized these things and then now you can recognize times that you did them because that is the work. It's getting comfortable knowing it, owning it, and then when you move forward, working very hard to do better, right? I think Maya, Maya Angelou said it. When we know better, we do better, right? Do your best. That's all you can do. I can't, I'm butchering it now, but I'm paraphrasing. When we know better, we do better. And this is, this is the journey of the knowing so that we can get to the doing. Hey, so this is my first personal journal for our first fan book choice of Book Interrupted, which is White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism by Robin D'Angelo. And I had heard about this book before. I have a few friends that have recommended it. I also have read a bunch about the controversy about supporting a white author versus supporting a person of color. And I've heard all sides or both sides of that uh, discussion. I also realized that uh, we are six white women who are talking about this. And uh, we have a person of color as our fan who is uh, going to chose this book. And I realize that this is going to be very uncomfortable. Um, It's also going to be hopefully enlightening. Well, it will be enlightening. It's going to be difficult, but it's also really needed. And so I'm really, really looking forward to reading this book. I need to be better and I need to confront my white fragility and I need to just be better at this. And it's, I'm really nervous but I'm really glad that we are doing this book as our first fan book choice. We'll see you in my next personal journal once I start reading the book. All right. So I'm just going to come out and say it. Whose bright idea was to do this book? I'm just kidding. I say that because this would be, if I wasn't in a book club or a podcast, this would be the sort of book that I would absolutely want to do on my own hidden in a cave somewhere where I could feel all my privilege shame on my own. However, uh, this is going to be quite the adventure. I am absolutely looking forward to diving into this material. I have actually already started on the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, throughout COVID, just really trying to up my game but I've been doing it on my own sweet time and being able to reflect upon previous blunders or mishaps or areas where I didn't even realize I was speaking from a place of privilege. But now I'm going to be talking about all this stuff in a very public way. And I got to be honest, I'm not looking forward to it, not looking forward to it in the least. And yet at the same time, I'm absolutely looking forward to it because it's about freaking time. So I'm looking forward to diving right in, even though I am nervous as all heck. It's gotten to the point where I don't even know how to get dressed. For example, let's look at this beautiful top right here. Had it forever in a day. It's my favorite top. It was handmade in India. And yet I'm like, do I, is it okay to wear this? Like, I just, I'm not of that culture. And so, oh, really embracing this topic and really embracing this book. It's starting to have me questioning all things, things that I haven't previously questioned before, like even how to get dressed. 
So hold on to your hats, folks. A whole heck of a lot of learning is about to go down. I will inevitably be emb embarrassing myself, uh, probably having to make some apologies along the way. And I invite you to join us through all of that. All right. This interruption is brought to you by Unpublished. Do you want to know more about the members and in Book Interrupted? Go behind the scenes? Visit our website at www.bookinterrupted.com. Book Interrupted. Okay, so here's my interruption, Ramadan. And it's not just the fasting of Ramadan, so I don't want to say that Ramadan's my interruption because I think it's an important thing to have, you know, true empathy in the world. So I am proud of doing Ramadan. However, my interruption is how I always forget how like much brain fog and how like tired I feel during Ramadan and I just keep on scheduling my life like it's no big deal. And then Ramadan comes about and I'm like struggling to get things done and I'm shocked by it. So that's my interruption. My own personal delusion. <laughs> Book interrupted. Let's listen in to this episode's group discussion. We would like to welcome Squiggy, our fan, to the show and his fan book choice, Wait Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. Squeaky, you want to tell us why you picked the book? Welcome, Squeaky. Hello. Uh, thank you for having me on the podcast. So this book I came across during the height of the George Floyd BLM protests. And during lockdown here, I had a lot of time on my hands, so I figured I wanted to learn more. And from uh, there's many good lists out there of books that have been going around that people should read. And I picked this one. The biggest reason was is because it was the shortest on the list, to be honest. But then I really got into it. And there's a lot of interesting points that were being made. And it will definitely delve into all that. But the next thing was that I put on my social media that I'd be willing to talk to anybody about this book. And that's when Book Interrupted reached out to me, calling my bluff. So that's <laughs> one of the reasons why I'm here. Because I'm like, well, I said I'd talk about this book. And I'm here to be part of the discussion. Thank you so much nice. for coming. Yeah, thank you. We're happy you're here. Yeah, really, yeah, we really appreciate it. So anyone wants to start jumping off how they felt? I can if you guys want. Okay, I will. Yeah, yeah please. Do you mind if I do that for a second? Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. That'd be great. So, to those that are listening to the audio version of this, I am man and I'm also a person of color. My parents are of Indian descent. So I am a brown person in a room full of white women. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, I'm yes. not sure what yep. we all identify as. Over the last year, I've engaged in a lot of anti-racism conversations and talks and dialogues. And I have found my role is best at listening. It's a lot of self-reflection, a lot of self-awareness, a lot of people exploring things. One of the things that I do not do because I just don't have the energy or qualified is that I don't educate. There's a lot of resources out there. So sometimes in social media, someone even posted when I posted something about John A. McDonald, and she actually asked me to school her about John A. McDonald and the bad things he's done. And my response to that is, uh, it's not my job to school people. I also am not here to check up on homework because someone else said, well, I'll read the book and you'll make sure I read it. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to make you do that either. But at the end of the day, any progress or anything you do for anti-racism in your own life, read this book, watch a black movie, et cetera, et cetera, is the step forward. And that's what matters. So for me to walk into this virtual room of white women that are choosing to read this book, choosing to discuss it, it is a safe space. And I'm not here to judge or wave my finger because there's going to be a lot of topics that are difficult to talk about. Like there's a whole section called white women tears and in a room of white women, it's going to be really interesting. But since we're all coming from safe space, open dialogue, and knowing that we've all made mistakes in the past, I am a brown skin, so I do not know the black story. This book is also based in the States, which is slightly different than the Canadian experience, but very similar. Uh, but I fall more into the model minority, which is somewhat whitewashed without having the extreme 
suffering that Black or Aboriginals have suffered. So I just, I, I think I just wanted to open up that we're in a safe space to talk about things because I know this is going to be nervous for people to engage in. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I appreciate that. Thank you for well, and Squeaky, you grew it. up in oh, you grew up in a very white, um, <laughs> white suburb. So that you were a minority for sure in in mm-hmm. where we grew up. So, and uh, I can't wait till the, for the white woman tears part one because we there are a lot of tears on this show already. <laughs> already, oh dear, yeah, it's going to oh, yeah. happen. Yeah, I felt oh, teary eyed to that Squeaky part of the book. Giving, yeah. Yeah, I, <laughs> I felt teary-eyed as Squiggy was giving that fantastic intro just on, you know, responsibility. And yeah, I just, I really appreciated it that you're just not here to position yourself on any type of status battle. That you're just you know what really else I liked? Sorry to cut you off there, Leah. I mean, Kara. Um, Whoever you are. Yeah, one of those <laughs> sisters. Um, I like that you um, included in your introduction, like your intention, because I feel like often there is, I want to call it like a, a mine, like a landmine that uh, white people can step on where they assume because a person represents a particular group of people or well, because a person is a member of a group of a, t- a particular group of people that they represent all of them. And then you go to them as if they're the expert. So by you saying, you know, like, I'm not here to educate anybody, but I'm here to witness the conversation. Basically, you just kind of saved us from that awkward moment. If any of us did that by accident, you know? Yeah, and to take on to that, a friend of mine who is a news program director, he was talking about having people of color in reports and stuff like that, but he didn't want to feel make it feel like it was token. But at the end of the day, again, any effort is better than nothing. So I am not an anti-racism expert. I am a different Robin than Robin D'Angelo. That's my real name, but I'm squiggy here. But the fact that I am here as a token member of a minority. Like it can be labeled that way, but it's also you guys choosing to do that, gals, people Whatever. choosing to do that. <laughs> the idea of even choosing to do that because this was rooted more in talking about the concepts of these books as opposed to a straight up fan pick. The fan pick is a convenient title for something that is far more in depth. I really like that the way that you came to this is that you were like, I want to talk about this book. And that's kind of what book clubs are about is reading books and wanting to talk through the ideas with somebody else. Like this happens to me all the time where I read a book and I'm like, I need someone else to read this book so I can talk about it and I can process all this information. And I've been very interested in in media coverage of the Black Lives Matter protests is really made people think that they want to learn more about anti-racism. So, and uh, because I'm a little bit, I uh, can be a little intense. I'm, I'm like currently reading three books about it right now. Four? Three or four? Four. Meredith, um, like, she, when she myself. likes a topic, she dies right in. Right go, and so I'm I'm actually very excited about this because I'm I like to think that I'm like a fairly well informed person, but I know that this is a subject that I'm not as informed about as I would like to, and uh, I've already learned some stuff. So I'm really excited about these conversations. And it's the tricky thing searching. about this book, I find, Mayor, is that or everyone, it's like even with all reading, you're like you know you're deep diving in the topic. You can only be as informed as that. Like you cannot take off your skin suit. So that's what the, this book, I'm, I'm just, I'm not, I haven't finished the book yet. I just started it. So they're like, I can only see, like I'm learning and I'm like, man, I can't get out of my own way on this. My literally my own skin on this. My perspective is like, I'm reading it. I'm like, Jesus, I never thought about it like that. Like something as simple as she mentioning like Black History Month. I'd never thought about that in terms of like, of course, it should just be history months. Always. Like those stupid little (laughs) things that I'm like, it's like blinder after blinder after blinder on this one. Mm -hmm. I love the bit about, uh, I've only read the first two chapters as well, but the bit about Jackie Robinson, I thought that just like, I told Laird, I told everybody, because it it. says in the book, like I wrote it down, but she says that, um, like people were would say all the time, oh, Jackie Robinson, he was the first black man to break the color line as if it was his decision to be able to do that. Or he was the best and he wasn't good enough or there was no black people to be able to be good enough to be in ba- Major League Baseball until then. 
But then really we should be thinking about it is that he's the first black man whites allowed to play play major league baseball. Yeah. And like that yeah. was like a whatever moment for me. I was like, yeah, like why are so much of what we, you know, all of our history, all of the words that people use, it's, it's this like whitewashed idea of, you know, I would never have thought looking at that, that uh, the idea, right, of course, it's the old first black man that was allowed by white people to play wow. baseball. Like, just, it's not because they were just like, oh, maybe we'll let you be like, hmm, I can profit from you. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so you can come in, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. A similar me... um, thing happened in the small town that my husband was born and raised in. It was all predominantly uh, white immigrants. And then I think it was, was it in the 70s? A black family had moved to town, but there's like baseball like teams that you can like, you know, amateur baseball and all that. And in the black family, there was a very talented uh, black male player. And that was his in once all the white people realized how great he could play. He was like this coveted like individual who all the different teams wanted to have on their baseball team so that they could win. And then that was therefore the entry point into allowing the family to be a part of the town. And it's hard not to get like critical or judgmental or anything. And I just, I didn't understand, like, I must've asked my husband to tell me that story like three or four times because I just didn't, I was like, I don't understand. I was like, so because he's been at baseball, then all of a sudden your small town was like, all right, I guess we'll consider allowing like non-whites to come in. And he's like, but that's just how it is. That's how we were indoctrinated. That's how we were raised. It's not a matter of, I guess we could slap labels of right or wrong on it. But at the time when you're within the context, he was like, he didn't even know to think otherwise. The question, why yeah. are we... Because it's like, well, we accepted him. It's like, but you only accepted him in a dehumanizing way. You didn't say I'm, yes. you're, you're in because, because you're a human being. No, that <laughs> like, you're in before. because you have something that I want. I guess. Yeah. I've been playing around with the, the concept of noise for a long while of what, of noise causing change. So let it be noise because of the skill of an athlete or noise because Trump is the loudest or what was mentioned also in the Ford is that the noise of women, the noise that women made to finally get the right to vote, because it was pointed out that men controlled the vote. So therefore it was men that would be allowed to let women vote. And it's just those little spins, like not Jackie Robinson, first black player, but white people let black players play or men let women vote, which that's a totally different way to say anything. Men let women vote is like, that doesn't sound feminist. That's weird. But it's because women made enough noise. It's because BLM made enough noise. It's because wow. playing sports has made enough noise because I grew up on the interracial glory story of sports. And like, remember the Titans and all those other movies where sports was the bridging gap. But that's just a noise of some way. Hmm. Yeah, it's like drawing hmm. attention to it. It kind of comes back to the base point of any move is a good move as long as awareness is somehow awakened. I, I'm probably going to butcher this, but there was, a, and it's funny because this was so powerful to me, but I listened to a podcast. I think it might've been Brene Brown and I'm not sure who she was talking to, but they likened the white experience of racism and their involvement in it to like being in a storm and having no idea that they're wet, right? Like the rain is, is the racism, right? And other people are like, it's raining. <laughs> like you're soaking wet. Like, and they're just like, I don't know. Like, I feel fun. Like, and so I, that was really meaningful to me because it really kind of captured like how invisible you can be by being a white person, how, in how invisible it can be to a white person, how you participate without even knowing, right? You want to say, I'm not racist, mm. but you're soaking wet. <laughs> like you, you are like you, but if you don't get your umbrella, you are. And so I think this work is like us all finding an umbrella and kind of opening it so that we yeah, can and, the rain. <laughs> and because of like white centering, I mean, just, just look at any individual human being, uh, like look at a kid, their whole life is centered around them. And then as you get older, you learn how to get along with other people. 
And, but if you're white, some of us, yeah. (laughs) But if you're white, as you get older, the world in a way still, uh, you're still the center of the world because everything's still around you. And so instead of learning the way the world doesn't revolve around you, like you think when you're a kid, oh yeah, I learned the world didn't revolve around me, but we didn't really until you look a little bit deeper. Like Leah was saying, she's like, all these blinders are coming off. And you realize like, oh, I guess I have kind of been acting like the world revolves around me and it doesn't or shouldn't, Mm. or rather it shouldn't. Shouldn't. Um, Right. One of the things um, in the book that I kind of like, like, first of all, I've only read the first chapter, was that, like, I like how she said, you're going to think of all the reasons why you're exempt to this, which I did. Like, I was like, well, I'm married to a person of color. And I have children that are people of color and I live in a place where I am a minority and, 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 and then she called me out and I was like, oh, and And I was like, oh, that she totally got me. One of them later is like, I can't be racist. I'm Canadian. (laughs) It's like, (laughs) who says? It's like, wake up. Yeah. Um, But one of the things I kind of like, it's true that um, I sent out a video uh, to you guys with Miriam. I can't oh remember. gosh, it was so good. Her last yeah. name, the, Let the me famous get it. South African jazz yeah, singer. Second. Oh yeah, um, I watched it. So she was doing an interview and one of the things they were asking her about, she was saying, you know, where the interviewer said something along the lines of countries where people of color are minorities, right? And she's like, it doesn't matter if they're a minority or the majority. White is always on top. That's what she it's said. She doesn't power. matter. That doesn't mm-hmm. matter. And so it made me think about. So I I see it less living in Senegal. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's just yeah. Miriam Makiba. Yeah, Makiba. Yeah. So yeah. Was, did you see that thing on C um, on CBC where they had um, houses assessed? They got a, a couple of uh, assessment companies, and it was the same house, and they had uh, different couples um, of a white couple and a black couple and then like another minority yeah and they and, pay more and then they looked at the discrepancy between the two assessments and then like the white assessment was like pretty like this basically the same between the two and but anyway the the black woman there was a huge difference like of like oh it was something huge like three hundred thousand dollars difference or something like it was like this huge discrepancy and so one person uh, rated it way higher or a little bit higher than the other ones and one was like way lower like it's just like your house is worth less because you live here you know what I mean like there's I wondered if Squiggy had some like examples like for you when you read this book did you f- find that you had blinders even because you have grown up in a in a primarily white not that like did you not notice how you were being treated yeah. Maybe in a racist manner. Like, did you even. accept or was it always obvious to you? It was always fairly obvious to me. Like, yeah. I I was always the one randomly selected at the airport for searches and stuff like that, wow. and just people's hesitancy and tendencies. But this one thing that I, I really enjoyed about this book, and uh, this also touches upon one of the disputes about this book compared to other things, is that we all have stories. And we all have facts and we all have reports that racism exists. This book really coming from a white person, turning the mirror on the white person. So it's not about stories. It's not about defining that racism exists. It's making it approachable in a way that people are more comfortable talking about it. Again, that's the other thing about I will not educate. I also won't debate. If someone comes in and says racism doesn't exist or I don't see color and stuff like that, Mm -hmm. that is not where I'm going to spend time. Mark Manson's book, uh, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, its main thing is that, oh, is swearing okay? Does it get bleeped out? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, No, swear swear. swear. Swear away. away. You'll make us feel Uh, more comfortable. (laughs) Swear all you want. One of the the overarching theme of that is that you only have so many fucks to give in a day, so choose what you give a fuck about. So just with the door being open, I would rather give a fuck about coming on here and talking to you ladies than engaging in a troll about I don't see color or racism doesn't exist. That's a good uh, point that the book starts from a place of like 
this is the platform's one up. It's like, does racism exist and where is it? No, it starts from it exists. Next step. <laughs> and you're it's kind of an of interesting, <laughs> yeah. 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 You're a part of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, you're already doing it. She doesn't, she doesn't try and prove it. No. Yeah. She doesn't need to. Yeah. You can debate inside your own head as you read the book. She's not going to yeah. try to convince you. She's like, <laughs> let me show you all the ways so that at the end you'll be like, okay, I, I get it now. Right. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Book Interrupted. If you'd like to see the video highlights from this episode, please go to our YouTube channel, Book Interrupted. You can also find our videos on www.bookinterrupted.com. A book club is just a book without members. Join the community by following us on Facebook, Instagram, or sign up for exclusive content through our website, bookinterrupted.com unpublished. We'd like to give a big shout out to our listeners. Your support makes this all possible. Thank you for the uplifting feedback and for recommending us to family and friends. We love hearing from you. Please reach out through our website at bookinterrupted.com slash fans or by emailing connect at bookinterrupted.com. We appreciate you for taking time out of your busy schedule to connect with us. See you next time on Book Interrupted. Moments you can look forward to on next week's Book Interrupted. And then I looked around the movie theater and I was the only person of color. So a thing called the familiarity bias. I think I only had white teachers. The no, same. We are I teaching racism in like, school. We we're teaching, teaching anti-racism. anti-racism. <laughs> Sorry. Education system is not only a tool, it's been a weapon. Encourage this educational overhaul. Vote in political representation. Creating the society they want, whoever they are. Book Interrupted.